I'm really excited today to be speaking to Stacia Lemo about her book, Exposed, Environmental Politics and the Pleasures of Post-Human Times. And it's such an interesting and important book. Stacy. thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I was wondering, maybe right off the bat, when you tell people that you are writing this book or after you've finished, what do you tell them this book is about? I mean, of course, we can look at the back of it, we can look at the descriptions and, uh, and the reviews, but yeah, if you're having a casual conversation, I'm curious, what do you say the book is about? <laughs> oh, well, I wish I had a great answer for that. <laughs> well, it's not as easy to explain in some ways as my last book, Bodily Natures, because Bodily Natures was a lot more focused on environmental health and environmental justice movement and developing specific form of, of new materialism, a, a material feminist and environmental new materialism in which the body was interconnected with the material world. And because it was about environmental health and environmental justice, it focused a lot on science studies questions of scientific captures of, say, invisible toxins. So the, the, the toxins gave that a, a much closer focus. And so this book draws a lot from bodily natures in the sense that it's also emphasizing modes of exposure and material interconnection with the world. So the ways in which the human body is interconnected with the material world. But it's a lot more wide ranging in its topics, everything from queer animals to naked protesting to ocean activism and feminist views of the Anthropocene with the extinction of various sea creatures. So it ranges a lot more widely, but all of the different chapters in some ways are all about critiquing human exceptionalism and capitalist individualism in the way that both of those things abstract the human from the material world and either background nature or make it a standing reserve or a resource and the ways in which our models of knowing and being and really onto epistemology, because the two things become very connected, our ways of mo knowing and being, this onto epistemology, the, the normal way of doing that to me, you know, or of living and thinking, seems to me profoundly harmful in environmental terms, and also in terms of health. And so I'm trying to find all kinds of different ways to combat what we think of as just normal ways of being and thinking, which abstract us from the interactions mm -hmm. of the material world. Now, you're in Arlington, Texas, right? Yeah, so I live in Dallas. Okay, I'm yes. at uh, UT Arlington. In Arlington, it sounds like you, you take some ideas that you've seen. The thing that struck me, because I hadn't really heard of it so much, was the idea of uh, guys souping up their trucks to expose more toxins into the air, to, to leave a bigger, darker trail. You mentioned uh, these same people often will like put testicles on their cars, not even, not even metaphorically, right? We're like literally images of testicles. And so anyway, I say that because you have these examples that I'm sure that you've seen around and that are, are clearly something to think about in different ways as you do in the book. Are you seeing these kinds of things around you, whatever they may be, naked protesters, art movements, these trucks spewing chemicals out into the environment? Are you seeing these things and then asking yourself sort of how to think about them ontologically and through various frameworks? Or perhaps you're thinking of these frameworks and then you see these things as, as great examples. How do, you, how do you choose what to include in the book in, in terms of your examples and your theories? That's a really hard question. I, I mean, I think I'm always noticing these sorts of things. And in Texas, in Texas, there's no shortage of what I'm calling displays of carbon yeah. masculinity. It, it's everywhere. Carbon masculinities are, are everywhere in Texas. Everything is bigger, harder, faster, more aggressive. It, it's actually really terrifying to be on the road here, honestly. And I and I was on the road once when when someone spewed all that coal in it, and it we were on the highway and we almost crashed because you couldn't see anything. So it's actually quite quite aggressive and and harmful. But whether the theory comes first or the, the examples come first, I think it, I go back and forth. So as, as a cultural studies scholar, so I, I like to think of myself as a theorist, but really as a cultural studies sort of theorist, I try to find things that to me are philosophically problematic or philosophical questions that I can't quite grasp, but then work through them not at an abstract level because that would not make sense 
for the sorts of things I'm arguing for, if I'm arguing against this kind of abstraction of the human from the interactions of the world, it's much better to take a cultural studies approach and stay low and take these things that are erupting in the world in various ways and analyzing those and thinking through those. So I think I go, I just keep going back and forth between the kind of theorizing and the, the, the cultural objects. And, but for this, for that particular, for that particular example, you know, most of the essays in this book were because I was invited to give a talk on something. And so this one was, I was invited to speak at the, the gender and climate change conference in Copenhagen, which was was really amazing. But I was not working on climate change at that moment. And because I'm a more of a post structuralist and gender minimizing feminist, and I'm very critical of many forms of eco feminism, the, the, the bringing together the question of gender and, and the environment is always a little tricky for me, because I don't want to counterpose a kind of positive, you know, women are closer to nature sort of position that's still sort of there in the world. And I think it's a dangerous idea. And so but then, you know, there were many things to critique. And and the funny thing about being in Copenhagen was there I am in Copenhagen and they're driving around in tiny Mm -hmm. little cars. And most people have bikes. Most people are transporting their children in hoppers in front of the bike. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm coming from Texas. (laughs) Tell people in Copenhagen about gender and climate change, the absurdity of that. So I sort of went with the absurdity and thought I'd be a kind of native informant about what Texas and the United States are like. <laughs> That's not the best <laughs> and, image of, and, of and, us and, here, okay. I guess. No, it's not the best image. But yeah, it's, it's pretty dramatic, though, um, for Europeans to think through what what is going on here in terms of climate change. So yes, yeah, so I got the, the bull testicles and all of those sorts of things for that for that talk. Yeah, well, and, they were, they were appropriately horrified. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I would I would love to see the audience reaction there in Copenhagen explaining something like that. I remember the first time I heard about that. I, I moved from Toronto to Georgia, and I've been here for a few years. But it was in Georgia that I learned that that's a thing that happens, uh, that some people will do to their cars and stuff. I hadn't heard of that before. And it took a few minutes of explaining and, and trying to figure out whether people were playing a joke on me. Uh, I'm sure yeah, a few exactly. of them might have been thinking oh. that, too. Exactly. Well, I go to I go to Sweden a lot um, to Tema Linköping in the Post Humanities Hub. There, I've I've been going there for for many years, various talks and to teach courses and things. And there's often moments where I explain what is happening in Texas or what is normal in Texas, and they they think I'm <laughs> lying. I mean, they they just can't believe it. They don't understand what I'm saying, even though their English is is absolutely perfect. It's just this incomprehension that this is what happens mm-hmm. in the world. So I, I have a little bit of a native informant in me, I think, about about my, my relationship to Texas in terms of climate yeah. change. Well, I'm, I'm also trying to imagine how you attempted to make a tone or set a tone in your book, because you're talking about climate change, which is obviously a very, very serious issue. You're talking about destruction of the planet in some cases, and you're talking about uh, inequalities in other uh, other areas that all of which, when you really start to think about it, can be really depressing. And I know I can, and a few, um, lots of other people, I'm sure, either don't want to think about this because of how sad and dramatic it is, or, or do and then become depressed. But you also write in your book that uh, if we cannot laugh we will not desire this revolution. And a lot of your thing, a lot of the moments that you talk about, like even this uh, with the testicles being put on cars and with um, with protesters taking off their tops and shouting poetry at bewildered forestry workers or whatever. Yeah, these are these are. So your book is sort of really sad when it comes to what is going on in our world and in our environment and what we're doing as humans to it. But it's also somewhat well, it is. It's pleasurable to read and it's um, funny in parts. Is that a conscious decision? And how do you how do you set the tone for a book that deals with these these extremes sort of? Yes. And I will first say that it's absolutely not the case that I am at all flippant or don't care about these issues. That It's more that I care so deeply about these issues that I could I could be pushed into a a horrific state of depression Mm -hmm. and despair very, very easily, really. I mean, because I've been, you know, I've been an environmentalist and an animal person my whole life. And the the fact that things are so extremely bad right now in terms of climate change and extinction and toxins, people still, you know, people don't talk about toxins enough, in my view, um, and environmental racism, which it remains such a huge problem in this country. And then, of course, climate justice, which is a worldwide issue. It's overwhelming. And I think, I mean, I think that the, you really do need the humor 
to be able to stay with these with these problems, because I think it's so much easier to turn away. And, you know, and I see this when I teach classes in environmentalism, a lot of students, especially, you know, the Texas students, there's not a lot of environmental consciousness here. So sometimes the issues are really new to them and and really disturbing to them. I've had students say, I don't understand why I've never heard about any of these things before. Why are we not told or things like uh, I have issues with depression and this class isn't making it any better. And so, I mean, I think that we do have to find ways to sustain ourselves because we're not going to be of any use in any of these political struggles if if we're just flat out despairing so much that we're, we're incapable of doing anything. So I think I think the humor can be really useful that way. So yes, it was it was definitely a it was definitely a, a conscious decision um, to answer your question. And you know, I'm not really a very funny person. I wish I were really funny. I would love to be really funny, but I'm really not all that funny. I'm very serious most of the time. I can be wacky, but I'm, I'm not, I don't have a great wit or anything. So, But I do think good to bring up these examples that, that have so much humor in them. And so I do try to cultivate that. And I, and I think that there are a lot of us now, even people who came out of very theoretical backgrounds. I mean, my, most of the, the work that I did earlier was very much based in post-structuralism and post-modernism and post-Marxism of Laclau and Muth and cultural studies theory and feminist theory and, and all sorts of things. And but I do I do think that there's a value in trying to write in such a way that more people will enjoy reading books because you, you don't want such a small audience of readers. And I think I think something that we can do in the humanities is try to think of our writing as a kind of art or performance or something to, to pull people in. So definitely something that I tried to do. And how would you say you balance the idea of adding humor or lightening the mood to an extent that it doesn't lead to deep depression when you're dealing with such serious issues, but also not going so far that it just becomes a sort of apathy or just a sort of, not satire, but a way of thinking of the world in a almost dismissive way? Like, I'm sure you've seen or heard other people who become basically so skeptical and dismissive that it, it, they've gone so far into the other direction to escape the how serious the issue is, how do you find a balance or, or are there techniques that you've seen to help you balance? That's a really great question. I mean, in some ways, I'm going to sidestep the question just a little only because I think that the kinds of topics that I work on, namely this idea of mine of transcorporeality, but tracing how everything we do at all sorts of scales has effects that that puts you already in a very politicized mode. So even as the book contains a lot of humor, there's also emphasis on always recognizing how each of us are immersed in these networks and these interactions that have effects even globally on other people's other non-human lives, ecologies, etc. So if you're if you're starting from the standpoint that pretty much everything that you do is a kind of ethical political matter in some ways, even if you don't understand how that's all working out and it can't be traced and there's issues of scale, mm-hmm. then there is no, I mean, there is no, my, my emphasis on immersion means there is no place outside. So you can't, as kind of cynicism or blithe humor or dismissive humor isn't really possible because there's nowhere to go. You're always in it. Yeah. So in, in other words, not being able to escape this is where it's the humor won't take over. In other words, it won't it won't become so so dismissive or, or satirical or skeptic skeptical because as you emphasize in the book, you're always going to be continuing to face these things. So you can't shut off from it. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think I mean I think my question the way in which this plays out that I'm more uncertain about is maybe in the last chapter with the thinking about the dissolve of these sea creatures as this sort of this aesthetic rendering of mass extinction in the oceans, which is really troubling, right? I mean, what does it 
mean to render something aesthetic like that, this this dissolve of the shell, and then to see that as this kind of psychedelic experience. I'm, I'm sort of disturbed by my own argument there, but I think that one of the reasons I made the argument is that sort of aesthetic engagement and even psychedelic engagement, and psychedelics are often about scale shifting, the weirdness of scale shifting, um, that that does make you continue to connect with these problems across these vast scales in a kind of empathetic way, instead of shutting it off or shutting it down. So that, you know, that that last or the penultimate chapter in the book is, I mean, it's not it's different than humor, but that sort of aesthetic rendering of something so horrific does come into question as to whether or not that's a useful way of thinking about it. But I guess for me, the bottom line would be any you know, any anything that gets us to stay with these questions that we don't want to think about, and that also breaks down the kind of capitalist individualism and human exceptionalism and the backgrounding of the material environmental world is something to pursue. Mm -hmm. Well, and that sort of leads me into the next question I wanted to ask you, which is, uh, you start off the book saying that you're going to resist the temptation to engage in any sort of grand mapping or utterly lucid conceptualization, and I'm quoting, as that would be contrary to the embedded modes of epistemological, ethical, and political engagement that it traces, that the book traces. And in doing so, you choose a number of different examples, and you link them, like you said, in in various ways of understanding the world. But how do you, how do you, I guess, Set your sights on certain either objects that you want to talk about or theories and ideas that you want to talk about. How do you know? What, how do you make the decision of what to include or not include in this kind of work, while at the same time avoiding that kind of uh, grand mapping? How do you how do you approach that? Well, that that's the problem of cultural studies, right? That when uh, when I was in graduate school in the the late eighties and the early nineties, I was in a program that was very cultural studies oriented. And my first book, my first book is very true to this, this sort of discursive critique of, of different cultural moments. And even then, I mean, even then in a in an essay that became a chapter in there, I was writing about Mary Austin and connecting her with the progressive women's studies conservationists and doing a cultural studies analysis and critique. And I got back one of the reader's reports when I tried to publish it as an article said, these are two different things. You have literature on the one hand, and you have this progressive women conservation group. On the other hand, they can't be in the same essay. (laughs) (laughs) Why don't you write about Willa Cather and Mary Austin, it said. But I mean, the thing about cultural studies is that you can connect anything with anything potentially, right? So when cultural studies was just was just sort of starting out in its American version, people who are working, say, if you started with any kind of literary text, and then you would expand that out, you could potentially link anything with anything. And then that becomes an enormous research problem, because, Mm -hmm. you know, where, what, what do you look at? What do you not look at? It's a huge methodological problem in cultural studies that I don't know has ever been Solve because you don't want to ever foreclose anything in advance because that's the whole you know you know some some of the things that made the field so exciting like say Laura Kipnis's work on Hustler were these completely unexpected extraordinary sorts of interventions from odd places that you wouldn't expect so so I mean I think. I think one of the things is, since I'm arguing against this kind of mapping that's transcendent, so especially in the chapter, the, again, the penultimate chapter where I'm critiquing depictions of the Anthropocene, both in Depeschuk Rabardi's work and in the visualizations of the Anthropocene, and I'm arguing against this kind of transcendent mapping from above, then I guess I would have to, I would have to say that part of my academic practice is actually my everyday life and things that I happen to see, things that come to me as being, you know, I'm engaged in, I'm a very political person. So I've been long engaged with various political issues, especially with environmentalism. And I don't know, I mean, they, they, things just happen. And that that's okay, because I think that that's a kind of new materialist 
methodology in some ways. I mean, the unexpected things that happen are part of what I'm arguing for. So going to admit to a very messy methodology for the book. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's it's interesting, right? Because you're saying from the start that it's not a clean and clear and transcendent methodology. But at the same time, I don't think it's so messy that it doesn't make a certain kind of sense. Like if you if you were to try to understand what's going on, these things, you, you fit them nicely together, even though somebody else studying the same general topics might not ever choose those exact things to look at. And like you said, that's one of the, the great things and uh, uh, I guess exhilarating things in a sense about cultural studies and what you can and cannot do. So, but the, again, if you can do virtually anything, how do you make sure that you're sort of on task, I guess, and, and doing what you want to, what you think is the most appropriate? How do you make decisions in those cases? But maybe that deals with how you identify as a, as a new materialist. Why is that something that appeals to you and how does that inform your work? So when I wrote my first book, it was called Undomesticated Ground, Recasting Nature as Feminist Space. And I worked with a very clear methodology coming out of gender minimizing or post-structuralist feminism and LeClau and Mouffe, Stuart Hall, a kind of discursive critique looking at various articulations. So my question was, if there have been these, these problems with the whole idea of the feminization of nature, how have various women writer, activists and theorists dealt with that? in very specific cultural moments from the early 19th century to the 20th century. So, for example, in the 20s, with the with the struggles for birth control, right, there's very specific discourses of nature and birth control and, and then how, how various um, feminists intervened in that. With Darwinian feminists, it's a very different sort of intervention, taking ideas of evolution and using them to make these sort of queer and gender-minimizing feminisms. And what, what, one of the, the, the things that was important to me in that book was to find ways where feminism and environmentalism intersected that were not essentialist and that were not gender maximizing or, you know, saying there's something essentially feminine and, and, and natural and all of that. So it was a critique of that. But anyway, what happened was, is that at a certain point, I thought, isn't it ironic that I'm I'm looking at nature and the environment? There's no way in my methodology for the material world to intra-act or to to have an effect to sort of talk back to any of the discursive or ideological or textual ways that the nature is being described. Okay, so it was, I thought, you know, the, the, the methodology works perfectly within English studies because we look at text. And so that kind of discursive critique worked really well. But for environmental studies, the method was staying so much within the nature culture divide, even though some of the texts that I was writing about were not. And so I thought, how can I keep this sort of incisive, discursive critique of, of cultural, of social constructionism, which is really important to feminism, to queer theory, to race theory? You know, social constructionism has been so important. Is there a way to keep that, but then also to allow some kind of nature or environment or materiality or something to interact or interact or talk back to those formations? And so I set out on a grand search. I looked mainly in environmental theory, feminist corporeality theory, science studies, disability studies, some race studies. I look across all those fields and a lot of that searching resulted in the edited collection of material feminisms. And then in bodily natures, I created my own, I think, pretty coherent way of thinking through what it means for the human to be enmeshed in the material world. And so I think that for me, for me, the, the issue with new materialism is that it has to have a way of accounting for the significance and the impact and the actions of the material world. Other people define new materialism differently, I think, but for me as an environmentalist, but also um, as a feminist, I think that there has to be that sense of material agency. So me, for me, new materialism all comes down to material agency. And what exactly do you mean by material agency? Then how do you how do you how do you imagine like where do you see that? If you could think of a good example of of where you see material agency at play, it's easiest to explain this with toxins. I think. Okay, so I'll go through a toxin example. So if I go down, I, ha I ha actually have a neighbor. I told some Germans this once, and they were so appalled by this. Again, native informant. I have a neighbor. 
neighbor who likes to experiment with different chemicals on his lawn and and kill everything in the whole lawn with different chemicals. And then, I don't know, then he tries to plant new grass or something. But for me, material agency is that sense that with, with a substance like a toxins, it's going to do things. It's going to do unwanted things. It's it, um, that the material world isn't a background for us, but instead the very chemicals that you put on your lawn, of course, will come back in your drinking water to some degree, will enter your body, will give you cancer or some other illness. And I think that capitalism, of course, capitalism wants us to think of commodities as being objects that are, are completely contained and they do what they're supposed to do because they have been created by the corporation to do those things. And so that, that sense of the containment of the resources, so that the whole world is just this sort of resource for capitalism to make into products and these products are these objects that do what they're supposed to do. That is exactly the thing that a notion of, in, in my mind, material agency gets around. So all of these, all of these substances and objects have their own effects, whether whether we know about it or can map it or not. Things are happening. All of these, and this is where Karen Barad's work has been really important to me because of her notion of intraaction. So that there's not with intraaction, and this is why I'm really different from the object-oriented ontologists who begin with separate objects. I like Barad's theory because nothing is ultimately separable. Everything is interacting all the time. So, you know, right now, what's happening in my body? Maybe, maybe uh, chemicals from when I was a child are now are still in there and there may be causing something to happen. I don't know. But seeing the world that way to me makes environmentalism not an elective enterprise, but instead again, you know, going with the immersion metaphors from exposed something we're all, we're always immersed in the material world. It's never somewhere else and it cannot be contained in ways that we can control or predict. Was there a moment that seemed to click for you, something that you uh, might have read a specific idea or, or chapter perhaps where you realized that this was the way to go in your own work? Yeah. And actually some, some of it, there, there are two, two things maybe in the reading. Well, one, one example from the reading and then one example from activism. So one in, in the reading, I was, I read lots and lots and lots of feminist corporeality theory. And I had a graduate student working on that topic, doing an independent study. And we read lots of things. And I thought at, at that specific moment in time, almost everything was about representing like representations of the body in feminist corporeal theory. Mm -hmm. Almost all of it was about representations. And there was one piece on gymnastics. And I thought, you know, I had been a gymnast shortly or for a short while when I was um, in high school. And I thought, you know, this is also all, this is all about the critique of how, of how gymnastics is represented. And I thought that's all well and good, but what does it mean to actually be in those bodies as a female, being a body that is so strong and so powerful and so brave, doing these incredible things, what does that actually feel like? And so I just, I got, I got a little um, tired of seeing critiques of representations. And I thought, surely there's something else we can do as a critical mode. You know, why, why mm -hmm. has critique run out of steam, as, as Latour asks. And I remember uh, Claire Colebrook had written some things using a Deleuzian perspective. And I think one of them was actually about anorexia, which was really interesting and had a very different kind of methodology. So there was that. And then I also uh, had the Greenpeace had sent me this um, hair sampling kit. So it was, it was a campaign against mercury. And what you were supposed to do is cut your hair, a little piece of your hair. It had a little a little balance in there. You had to cut off enough hair to make the balance fall over. So you, you had to cut off some hair, mail the hair to Greenpeace, and they would test it for mercury to toxicity. Mm -hmm. And they, and then they sent back the results. And it was this big blank sheet of paper with this little number on it. And I thought, how weird it is to send my hair through the mail 
and then just get this number, which was pretty much meaningless to me, of course. I don't know what the number meant. And then it, it, it explained what the number meant in terms of health. And then I thought about my whole life in terms of, well, where where would I have gotten this much mercury in my body and how? And, and But then they also, of course, had a list of things you could do for your health to avoid mercury, but then most importantly, all sorts of political ideas for how to fight against the causes of mercury in the environment. And I just, I love the fact that this started in such a weird way with this, my hair going off into the U.S. mail system and then and then coming back and then that this was a kind of politics that was tracing all of these interconnections and making you so aware of all of these interconnections that you, and this is the science studies part, that you may or may not understand. And if you do understand it, it's partly because of the political, the political movements that are actively making that science happen and articulating it for larger audiences. So all of those separations that we have all kind of were just shot through and and by this one moment. I think that was a pivotal moment to me. In the work that you do and the way that you contribute to these interactions in, in multiple ways, but let's, I guess, focus sort of on the book that we're talking about, Exposed. How do you see your role as a node or however you want to think of it in other relations? Like, what is what is your goal, I guess, in how you relate this information or how you relate ideas or how you transfer information from one from one place to another? Uh, what, are, what are you trying to do while acknowledging where you fit within these interactions? Hmm. That's a hard question. I mean, I hope I mean, I hope people, all sorts of people will read the book and that scholars will find it useful in some ways for opening up their own work. It makes me happy when, say, people who are not academics have read the work and write to me, people who are artists or landscape artists or even a musician. Some other people have used some of the ideas to actually create things in the world. That's, I mean, I I don't think there's anything much more exciting than that to know that people who are working in various artistic media find your work useful and are creating things from it. I don't know. I mean, I I don't think I have a good answer for you on this one. (laughs) No, no. It's interesting to hear how different people approach their work because would ideally everybody in America, let's say, or throughout the world be reading it or would that not be exactly what you would want to see in an ideal situation? I mean, it's hard because I do think that in this book, a lot of my theoretical background is submerged rather than right on the surface. And yet, it does. My background in theory does really guide everything that I write and the way that I think and the way that I live. And so it's all really there, but it is a bit submerged. So I don't think the book's inaccessible in that way. And I do try to write in a clear way. But then, of course, as an academic, it's hard not to be aware of the fact that academic books still are academic books and they're not mm-hmm. written for a popular audience. They're, they're a little too dense. I mean, I have looking through this before talking to you, you know, some of the points that I think are really important in the book are probably too dense in terms of their, of how I, how I wrote them. I mean, I like to be very concise and I don't know. I mean, I don't know that that, that kind of writing can go too widely across audiences. Yeah, well, I mean, that's something that I think I struggle with and probably every academic struggles with is how do you balance accessibility without sim- overly simplifying or without really doing these ideas justice in terms of tracing their genealogies and where they fit within academic discussions. Right. But I just had this vision, I guess, of looking over your book last night and thinking about these guys who are souping up their cars to spew smoke out of their exhaust pipes or whatever, and you driving behind them or something, and probably knowing, I mean, because I've had somewhat similar experiences, just knowing that this is a really big issue that at least these people don't seem to be taking very seriously, or if they do, they seem just so misguided or something. I don't even want to, I mean, I don't understand exactly why anyone would do that. But yeah, so but you have these people and you know... I mean, I think it's fairly reasonable to assume that they're not picking up exposed. No, I doubt it. 
And so I'm wondering, would you want that to happen? Would you want to be able to say like, hey, guys, turn off the engine for a second and I have a present for you. Here's a copy of my book or something. <laughs> would you want them to eventually maybe read it and, and think about it? Or do you think that your role as a scholar, as an academic and as a writer is perhaps to influence somebody who will then maybe influence some other way and then through these interconnections, maybe get to these guys or are these guys, as an example, just probably not going to be reached, but perhaps the next generation? Like, I'm wondering how you see that. Yeah, ideally, I wish all sorts of people would read the book I, and other books that are about environmentalism and social justice. I think that that would be fantastic. I do think probably to be realistic, what happens is that students read it. Right. So I know that a lot of a lot of mm. people are using the book in undergraduate classes as well as graduate classes. And I think that that students read things and then they go home and they tell their families or their their friends about some of the ideas. And so I do I do think that through our teaching and, and what we assign when we teach, that that does have an effect that those ideas do go outwards because of that. I was just I just gave a talk. It was so great to be able to give this particular kind of talk. A local activist group invited me to come talk to them and to energize their canvassers before they went out to canvas. So it was a Friday afternoon. And right before they go out to canvas, I talked to them for an hour. And then as soon as my talk was done and they, they asked a few questions, they had some comments and then they ran out to the door to go canvassing for environmentalism. So that was great. But they actually had a I need to send them some books. They wanted me to give them some of my books for their activist, their activist library. They have an activist library there. And so I do think that a lot of activist groups and, and then a lot of other people who are politically active read my work, read academic books that are kind of crossover books. So, you know, it, it's hard. It's hard when you're writing. I actually agonize this about a little bit because it, on the one hand, I have these complicated or dense theories that I want to get across or analyses I want to get across. And then on the other hand, you do want to make it accessible to more people. And I, I like I like the kind of back and forth in terms of thinking through activism. And, and one of the earlier questions that you had about what I chose to include. I, I do like to take activism really seriously as something to analyze because I do think it's a it's a mode of, of creative thought and philosophy and action and it's all sort of happening in, in these particular moments. And so having the activism sort of in the book means that there's already a kind of dialogue between and across kind of academic and non-academic realms in a way. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I wish the guys rolling coal would want to read my book, but it's hard to imagine that would happen. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's, I guess you do have to sort of pick your battles and decide what is what is worth approaching and aiming towards and what's not. Right. And I'm sure these are also not people you have in mind when you're writing to sort of imagined audience yeah. as you're working on your, your scholarship. Do you have uh, any idea of where you want to take your work now after doing Exposed? Is there, an, is there another idea that you are pursuing or are you continuing in a certain direction from there? Yes. Right now what I'm working on is helping to develop what we're calling the blue humanities. So switching from a more terrestrial environmental humanities to a more ocean-centered humanity. So it's sort of science studies of the ocean is what I'm doing right now. And I'm working on deep sea creatures and how they've been represented aesthetically in science and popular culture. So I start mainly in the early 20th century and then into the early 21st century. So pretty much sent the long 20th century of uh, the representation of deep sea creatures. And my question there is, how could it be possible to get people to extend the terrain of their environmental concern even to the bottom of the sea? So what I'm questioning is aesthetics and how aesthetics move around politically and ethically and how they're used in science. But it's also the, the sort of political urgency of the project is because of the impending collapse of ocean ecologies, but also things like the deep sea mining that's going to happen and other extractive industries that are destroying ocean ecosystems or habitats that, that are almost not entirely not understood by science at all. So I think it's this weird anachronistic moment in which 
we know all of this extinction is happening. And then there's other extinction that is probably most likely happening that in which we will not have known all of the creatures rendered extinct by the kind of huge industrialized extractive industries in the ocean. And like how to how to think with that weird in, in terms of scale and temporality and the ways in which the legal systems and international politics can't even begin to deal with the question of the bottom of the sea. And also scientists don't know much about it. And what they do know is often really dependent on the very industries and the money from the industries and the technologies they develop that are destroying the very things that the scientists are exploring. So all of those, I'm interested in all of those paradoxes. Yeah. Is there anything in particular, like, is there a major thing that you've had to change in the way that you work or to conceive ideas, work on these ideas or when switching to the ocean, when switching from maybe terrestrial concerns or what have you to this new project? Is uh, there anything that has significantly made you rework or rethink something? Yes, definitely. And I think that my first three books are one argumentative art. The, the, the first three all fit together extremely well in terms of the way that they move, in terms of their theory and method and all of their topics are overlapping to some degree. But this next project with the deep sea creatures, it's more about aesthetics, which I've never really written about at all. It's more about animal studies. But also the biggest difference is the fact that, especially with the, the, the deep seas, it's so completely far from everyday life. So I've been writing about this kind of immersion and transcorporeality and all of these strange things in everyday life. And this is a much more mediated project. And that's one of the things I'm thinking through, too, is that sense of mediation, because I only know of deep sea creatures from the information I'm given through science and through these popular culture renditions of science. And so it feels really different. And in some ways, it's also because so little has been written about the oceans, it feels a little bit more like a cultural history. And I feel like I can't, I can't be as immediately, I can't be as playful and as sort of theoretical, you know, in a kind of submerged way immediately with the material because the, the cultural history and the, the sort of basic things have to be laid out first, because I can't assume anyone will know anything about much of the material that I'm talking about. So I, I can't, can't just dive in and do all kinds of crazy things with it because it doesn't exist as such. Does that make sense? I have to, I have to sort of pull, mm -hmm. yeah. I have to pull the archive together much more and it, and it's, it'll be much less immediately apparent to people than some of the other topics I've written about, I think. And so it's sort of, a, it feels, it feels a bit more distant, I guess, and, is there a way that you balance the sort of scientific environmental studies that I, I know that you're reading versus maybe the theoretical, more abstract, philosophical readings that you're also doing and tying them in with your books? For me, it's interesting to read to read your work and to read, I just read The Assemblage Brain. I did an interview with the author of that who talks a lot about neuroscience, but he's doing it from a Deleuzian perspective. Mm. And the hardest thing to me in even attempting to write, and that's not what I'm doing myself in my work, but attempting to put in a lot of science and a lot of work, a lot of a lot of things that, like you said, you need to explain for people, especially if they're not scientists or engineers or biologists or what have you. So you need to explain some stuff, but you also, because of the way that you're approaching it, want to be using and incorporating ideas that are, for the most part, critical theory, cultural studies, philosophy. Is there a way that you balance those things out in your reading and your writing? Yeah, I'm definitely, definitely working on that in the sense of, let's see, so theoretically, the, the idea of modes of capture in science studies, but then also in media studies has been important. And some of Latour's senses of composing the world and what this compositionism might mean, because that works well with, with, with the topic of the deep seas, definitely, or the oceans in general. But in terms of the writing right now, I mean, I guess one of the things that, that makes part of this project accessible in that way that you're talking about this kind of divide between the technical and the, the more sort of philosophical or theoretical is that the sources that I'm looking at, so the, the, the first chapters are about William Beebe and his descent in his bathysphere. And he was objecting to the way in which modern science in the early part of the 20th century was dividing 
scientific practice from philosophy and literature and the arts. And so he really wanted to bring those things together. So what I'm looking at is the ways in which I'm I'm looking at many examples where science and the arts are really intertwined. And so that does right there that the subject itself brings those things together. And also with end of the 20th century, the the census of marine life, which is this huge scientific project global 10 years identifying thousands of new species. I mean, this, this massive thing, they included a whole artistic dimension to that project. And so I'm focusing mainly on that aspect of it. So again, that part of it is a bit more accessible for um, cultural theory. But it's also interesting to me how some of the scientists write about these experiences, these kind of really aesthetic experiences that they have. And also in in terms of their own sense of even though they're supposed to be counting everything in the sea, that that idea is impossible. And yet how do they as a scientist negotiate this impossibility? So this, this epistemological almost absurdity, and yet they still do the science. So I think some of the philosophical issues and theoretical issues are already within a lot of the um, scientific sources that I'm looking at. So that helps. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I wonder if you have had any experience like this. I know I was talking to a few people and even Todd May, who wrote A Fragile Life, was saying that he often will do sort of more abstract, less overtly political work when he's participating in protests on in his time, uh, like in his spare time or whatever, outside of the, the research he's doing. He'll do more political work when that's necessary, and then he'll focus on more sort of abstract philosophy. But then when he's not particularly involved in a lot of social justice movements, he'll write more about that. And that's something that I do as well. I mean, sometimes I feel sort of burnt out from ha- from having called a congressman yelling at him or something and dealing with things in the, in the real world, if you want to call it that, which I know is problematic. But to deal with these political things makes me then want to say, I'm going to look at a film and just purely get the aesthetics of it in my next thing because I can't deal with this anymore. Do you have a balance or do you find yourself gravitating more or less towards these very serious political issues that are very contemporary versus sort of more more aesthetic abstract philosophies because I know in your book you do like I said you do a very nice job of, of merging the two I would say but yeah especially thinking of mass extinctions in the ocean I can only imagine how depressing that can be especially you know watching the destruction of the EPA and these other uh, entities that are supposed to protect the environment in current politics is there a way that you do you go off do you have like a side project or is there a way that you cope with that intellectually I love that idea that that you described of having that kind of balance well, ideally, I don't think any of us actually live that balance, but I know ideally there would be a balance. Right, yeah, or the, the, the way in which the, the things are complementary. You know, I think I probably do it. The, the, the place that I find that, that's sort of outside my, my sense of the thing that, that, that makes me come, see, you're just throwing me right off. It's weird because I when I work, almost all of my writing is political in some ways and is very concerned about the environment and other political issues. And so it's hard not to be engaged with how disturbing all of these things are. But I, I do think that in the course of writing, there's a way in which when you're just working on whatever the project is, or whatever the problem is, that you're just, you're just sort of with that sentence or with that idea or with the thing that you're mapping out. And one of the great things about meditation and Zen philosophies and Buddhist practices are all it's all about not adding on. And so if you're sitting with something, and I think that writing is a lot like meditation in that you're, you're sitting with something, some kind of a problem that you're working on, and you're just there with that thing and things are happening. You're, you're writing words and, and, and just to sort of, you, you strip that down to where you are in that moment, even if what you're trying to do in that moment is think through these issues that are really disturbing. While I'm writing, I'm kind of more in that meditational space. So I don't really have other projects, you know, that are less depressing to me or something, because I think that when I'm doing that kind of work, it's okay. And then the thing that I do to kind of balance is really, you know, take my dogs on a walk or garden, or I do a lot of making habitats in my yard for different 
animals and birds and things, planting things for birds and making little watering areas for the lizards. And I find a lot of comfort in that just because it's so immediate. So I think about all of the species that are under threat. And then I feed the birds that are in my yard because that's something I can do something about in that moment. And that's, that's, that's pretty comforting to me. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that makes a lot of sense. It sounds like you do have quite a balance that I'm kind of envious about. Well, I don't, I don't ever feel like I'm ban- <laughs> I, I feel like I never have enough time for anything. It's always yeah. rushing about. And Well, that's another issue. Yeah, how that's to fit another, everything that's in, for another sure. issue. But. When you think about the next, uh, let's say, five to ten years, what do you hope to see out of new materialist thinkers and writers and out of people working in environmental politics and maybe more broadly social justice? The kinds of the kinds of work that you're you're doing yourself, but also that you're seeing around with contemporaries. Where where do you hope all of this work leads if if you have any idea of where what you expect to see, what you want to see? Right. So in, in terms of some of the theories and the politics, we still need to work to to integrate race and maybe even queer studies into new materialism more. I mean, there's there's some that's happening now, but I think that I think for really good historical reasons, critical race theory has stayed a lot closer to post-structuralist models for, again, really good reasons. But I think that there's that there's more that's happening now that that's looking at how to integrate environmental studies, race, post-humanism, race, or, you know, changing, changing the whole, the whole way we look at that. Uh, Julieta Singe calls, calls for the term dehumanism, which is like decolonial. So much more interchange between, say, decolonial theory, race theory, queer theory, and environmentalism, posthumanism, new materialism. I think that that's really important. In terms of where I'd like to see some of the work go, just intellectually, I have a book series at Duke with Cole Starosielski called Elements, and that is about trace and a new materialist mode in which some kind of materiality is traced through all sorts of different domains. So you take something like potassium or something, perhaps, and tracing it in, in all kinds of unexpected ways that are completely transdisciplinary. And I hope political and philosophical, theoretical. So I, I'm hoping to see some really great projects come into that series. And again, like with culture, studies. I mean, it's sort of the same question we talked about earlier with cultural studies methodology. If you think in new materialist ways, or to, to borrow Karen Barad's specific way of thinking about it, you, you don't know where the cut will be. Like, what, where will you make the cut? I'm hoping to see some really innovative projects come in, into that series. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like an, it obviously is an important thing, but it also sounds like something that could be really productive for, for getting people to think in a, a slightly different way. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing more of that work. It was, it, I have to say, it was kind of weird reading your book because out of all the all the books I've read lately, I had a lot of feelings of, of concern for the environment, which I think is not surprising and of concern about what we're doing. But then at the same time, it was a really pleasurable experience reading your book. Like it... <laughs> It was, well, I mean, and I, 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 I was wondering why. Yeah, yeah, that is weird. And I, I say that not, I mean, it's, it does sound weird just saying that, but it's interesting. And I think it points to something that, that you're doing and perhaps more people are doing or trying to do, maybe not necessarily as successfully, which is deal with some very serious issues, but in a way that is to an extent aesthetically pleasing to read and balanced in terms of uh, the content and the tone. And so it was an interesting, it's an, it, well, it's a great book you're, you're exposed oh, to. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, I just want to thank you for uh, for taking the time out to speak with me today. Well, it was really a pleasure to talk with you. I, I loved your questions. They really made me think, yeah.